Dead America, the Second Month, the SoCal Mission, Part Two, written by Derek Slayton, narrated by Aaron Smith. Chapter One. Forty-five hours remain. Sergeant Wrangle and the rest of his team sat in the back of a beat-up pickup truck as they drove towards the town of Actis, a few miles to the west of Edwards Air Force Base. The sun set as they got closer, though there was nothing to see in the dimming light other than open arid desert. The teenage couple from town was in the back of the truck with the men, huddling together against the chill setting in. Corporal Reed and Private Cohen sat on either side of them, and realizing they were trembling, inched in a bit closer to try to shield the kids from the wind. Wrangle was emotionless looking at his watch to check the countdown as it ticked just under forty-five hours. Not only were they not en route to the nuclear plant, but they were headed in the wrong direction, with no way to get where they were going. The only thing giving him hope at the moment was that Jacob and his group seemed willing to help them as best they could. He just prayed it would be enough. The horn on the lead truck bleated as they approached Actis. Rather than being a real town, it looked like someone picked up part of a neighborhood and dropped it in the middle of the desert, along a highway. They had managed to put up perimeter defenses pretty well, using sedans to plug the holes between the houses on the outer streets, and building up fencing. If a horde came through, it would easily force its way through, but for the occasional straggler that would be out this far, it was fine. The horn honking got the attention of the people in the community who flashed a light, letting Jacob know they were opening up. A moment later, the convoy went through the gates, which closed up behind them. Jacob pulled up to a house near the center of the community and got out of the truck, prompting everyone else to follow suit. It ain't much, but it's home, he drawled, and pointed towards the house next door. That one is empty if you and your men want to head there. I will have someone bring you some food and lights in a minute. I know you have a lot to do, so we will stay out of your way. Wrangle nodded and offered a thin smile. Thank you, Jacob, he replied. But if you wouldn't mind joining us, I think it would be helpful. We don't know anything about the area, so your expertise would be welcome. Of course, Sergeant, Jacob replied, nodding emphatically. Just let me jump into my house for a moment, and I'll be right over. Thank you, Wrangle replied and turned back to his men. All right, let's get us a plan together, he barked. Reed, Preston, I want to set up in the living room in five. Table, chairs, maps, anything else that might be useful. Both men replied in the affirmative and ran off to do their jobs. The others stood outside, stretching and shaking off the bumps from the ride in the back of the truck. Can't remember the last time I rode in the back of a truck like that, Cohen huffed. Charlie grinned. Used to do it all the time when I was a kid, he declared, raising a victory fist. Not the safest mode of transportation for kids, is it? Garrett asked, cocking a skeptical brow. Charlie shrugged sheepishly. Guess my parents thought I was young and could walk it off if something happened, he said. Garrett chuckled. Love those walk-it-off parents, he said, shaking his head. Mine thought the same thing when they took me to football practice. Given your size, I can see why they didn't worry too much, Charlie quipped, eyeing up the broad-shouldered private. Garrett laughed. Probably right about that, he admitted. My nickname in middle school was Freight Train. The group chuckled as they walked into the house. It was a small home that still had the stench of cigarette smoke in the walls and furniture. Everything looked pretty much the same as it had in the 1980s. Like stepping through a time warp, Lyons said, gaping around in wonder. Preston gagged. Yeah, a time warp with a two-pack-a-day habit, he muttered. He and Reed brought in a few more chairs to sit around a table they dragged into the living room. Charlie opened up a few windows to get some fresh airflow. It sent a chill through the room but it was better than the alternative of choking on stale smoke. All right, let's figure this out, Wrangle said, rallying everyone's attention. We have less than 45 hours to get 150 miles. How are we doing it? 
The most direct path is cutting through the San Bernardino National Forest, Reed suggested. Interstate 15 cuts straight through it. Yeah, and straight through San Bernardino, Cohen shot back, shaking his head. Not exactly a low-traffic area. The corporal shrugged. Well, it's better than going through downtown Los Angeles, he argued. That's like saying getting herpes is better than getting gonorrhea, Cohen snapped. Neither is a particularly great option. Wrangle crossed his arms. What about going around the forest, he suggested loudly. Reed traced his finger along a road leading far to the east before circling around to come back to the west. He tilted his head back and forth doing some light calculations in his head before responding. It's doable, he said slowly, but it will add another hundred or so miles to the trip. Plus, we still have to cut through the southern portion of San Bernardino. Garrett leaned forward to study the map closer. Looks like there's a lot of highways and interstates in the area, too, he said. One zombie triggered traffic jam, and we're walking. Wrangle sighed. Is there any other way? he asked. Reed studied the map closely, but he could only find roads going through the forest and around it. If there is, I'm not seeing it he said, shaking his head. Jacob entered the room quietly and slid into the last empty chair. How's it going? he asked. Like trying to find a wife in a whorehouse? Lyons quipped. Lots of options. None of them ideal. Well, maybe I can help, Jacob said brightly. Where are you thinking? Reed motioned for him to lean over the map and then showed him the two routes with his finger. So it's either go through San Bernardino, or take the long way around and risk getting stuck in a traffic jam since it's all highway and interstates, he explained. Jacob sucked in his cheeks for a moment as he thought hard, and then sat back, looking around at the men. I need a pen, he said. Charlie pulled one out and handed it over, and the farmer clicked it open and leaned over the map before pausing. Is it okay if I draw on here? he asked, glancing up at the sergeant. Wrangle motioned for him to continue. If it gets us to the destinations, by all means, he said. Jacob drew a line through the San Bernardino forest, right through the middle of it to the east, before cutting down into the Mount San Jacinto State Park. What is that? Reed asked, brow furrowing. Jacob tapped on it with the pen. That is Rattlesnake Creek, he explained or what's left of it. The droughts have turned it into a dried-up creek bed. You can access it from this point. He paused, and then drew along the northern side of the forest. There are campsites and off-road trails through here that lead to it. It will take you straight through, cutting across the highway here, and ride into Mount San Jacinto State Park. He took a deep breath. Now, I'm not too familiar with that area, but there are bound to be trails that will take you down to the south of the nuclear plant, or at the very least get you in the neighborhood. Wrangle chewed over that for a moment, and then looked around at his team, the men all looking deep in thought as they contemplated the suggestions. Thoughts? he asked. Lyons raised a hand first. I'm not opposed to it, he said. I always liked hiking, Garrett added. Given how densely populated this area of the state is, Charlie said slowly, I think it's our best shot at reaching the destination in time. Wrangle clapped his hands together. Okay, we know where we're going, he declared. How are we going to get there? Jacob, do you have any off-road vehicles? The farmer shook his head. Not that I'm aware of, he admitted, but I'm not a big off-roader. He pointed outside. If you go to the far side of the camp, we have some trucks we used for the blockade. We flatten the tires on one side to make it harder to push, but there are plenty of spares to be had. Garrett, Lyons, go check it out, Wrangle instructed. Double time it. The two men nodded and rushed outside, and the sergeant continued quickly. What about fuel? he asked. You said there was a gang at the gas station? Jacob sighed. Yeah, there is a truck stop about ten miles to the north in Mojave he replied with a nod. Best of my knowledge, it's the only one that isn't overrun with zombies that has fuel. But that's because one of the local gangs took it over. I'm guessing they aren't friendly, Wrangle asked, cocking a brow. Jacob shook his head vehemently. My guess is no, 
he said. We had one run-in with them, and they started shooting at us on sight. We have steered clear of it ever since. Do you have enough fuel to get us up there? Reed asked. Jacob nodded. We should be able to get you there, he said. Might have to coast back, though. You sure there aren't any other gas stations in the area? Preston asked with a sigh. Jacob shrugged. The only other town is Lancaster, which is about ten miles to the south of us, he explained. But it's huge. Define huge, Wrangle said firmly. 125, maybe 150,000 people pre-apocalypse, Jacob said dryly. Wrangle pursed his lips. Yeah, that qualifies as huge, especially since we're one firefight away from using knives, he muttered. Garrett and Lyons burst back inside, panting heavily. That was quick, Reed quipped. Garrett shook his head. Wasn't much to see, he huffed. Everything was two-wheel drive, and rated for nothing higher than driving the kids to soccer practice, Lyons added breathlessly. Reed grunted. There goes the off-roading, he muttered. Is there any place we can get some hardcore vehicles? Wrangle asked, turning back to Jacob. The farmer thought for a moment and then slowly nodded, but that quickly turned into him shaking his head. Wrangle gritted his teeth. Is that a yes or a no? he asked. There is, Jacob said, dragging out the word. But it's not going to be easy to get to. Color me surprised, Reed muttered. Where is it? Wrangle asked, shooting the corporal a look to shut up. Northern part of Lancaster? Jacob explained. There's a dealership that specializes in work trucks. Heavy-duty stuff. If any place is going to have what you're looking for, it's them. Lyons nodded. Great, we can pick those up and head out, he said, raising an excited fist. Win-win. Wrangle shook his head. Those heavy-duty trucks get gallons to the mile, he argued. Even if they have a full tank, which is unlikely, we're still going to need that extra fuel. Why not just get some on the way? Lyons asked, eyebrows raising. How many gas stations do you know of that set up in dried-up creek beds? Cohen snapped. Lyons opened his mouth to retort, but then snapped it shut again when he realized that his companion was totally right. So, this is the plan? Reed piped up, leaning forward. Get some trucks, rob a gang for some gas, and hit the road to go off-roading through a forest? Looks like it, Garrett quipped. Wrangle looked around the table. Unless someone has a better idea, that's the plan, he said. As he addressed his men, nobody responded in the negative, most just shrugging their shoulders in begrudging agreement. Okay, let's get geared up, he said, whirling a hand above his head. We head out in five. Chapter Two the soldiers geared up to head down to the car dealership in Lancaster. Wrangle approached Jacob, inclining his head in Charlie's direction, who was sitting on the front stoop of the house. Would you mind if we leave him here? the sergeant asked. Charlie is vital to the mission, and I would like to avoid putting him directly in harm's way if I can help it. Jacob nodded with a smile. Of course, he said. My people will take good care of him. Thank you. Wrangle replied firmly, and then turned to Charlie. I want you getting some sleep, he instructed. We probably won't have much time for the rest of this mission, and I need you rested. We're trained to operate with little to no sleep. Charlie scoffed. And I'm not? he drawled. You do realize I'm a PhD and I'm a computer specialist. Fair enough, Wrangle replied gently, raising his palms in surrender. But there is a huge difference between staying up typing away on the computer and running for your life as zombies try to get a bite out of your ass. Charlie paused and then nodded in agreement. Touché, Sergeant, he finally said. I'll get some rest. Jacob clucked his tongue to the teenagers. You make sure he has whatever he needs, he instructed. I'll be back soon. This gave Wrangle pause. I'm sorry, what? he asked, crossing his arms. Jacob straightened his shoulders. You're on a tight timetable, right? he asked. I've been going to Lancaster my whole life. If you're going to get in and out, you're going to need a tour guide. Dad? Jacob's voice asked from behind him, voice tinged with an edge of panic. 
It's okay, son. We won't be long, he replied, voice softening as he turned to assure his child. These boys are on a timetable. I think we can handle it, Wrangle insisted. Wasn't a request, Jacob said, turning back to the sergeant and standing firm. You failing your mission harms us, and I want to make sure you take the long way back. The sergeant's brow furrowed. Long way back? he asked. Jacob nodded. Yeah, I'm going to take you on some back roads that wind through the desert before coming back here, he explained. If we get a mob of those things following us, they could find their way up here. And I don't know if you have noticed or not, but we don't have the most sophisticated defenses. Wrangle clenched his jaw for a moment and then let out a deep sigh. Okay, you're in, he finally said, knowing this was the only option for these people. He wasn't keen on letting a civilian tag along, but it was what it was. But you do what I say when I say it, understand? Wouldn't have it any other way, Jacob agreed firmly. I know my way around, but you know how to survive out there. If you get me killed, I'm going to hold it against you. Wrangle smirked and motioned for Jacob to join in the discussion. The soldiers gathered around the table with him and spread out a big sheet of printer paper in the center. The sergeant tossed Jacob a pen. Okay, tell us what we got, he instructed. Jacob went to work right away, drawing on the paper and using simple boxes and lines to represent buildings and roads. He drew one in the center, with roads coming out and big boxes on the sides pointing and explaining as he went. This is the dealership, right on the edge of the business district, he said. Takes up a whole block. To the west is a large residential area, a solid mile of houses. To the north, south, and east are businesses. Reed cocked his head. Strip mall stuff, or are we talking standalone buildings? he asked. Some smaller strip malls, but mostly standalone buildings, Jacob replied with a soft nod. Nothing big like a supercenter or anything, but larger buildings with parking lots in front of them. I assume we're coming in from the west? the corporal asked, leaning over the paper and tapping on it with a finger. I would, Jacob agreed, motioning to the same area. The dealership is on the northeast side of town. Even with the standalone buildings, there isn't much in the way of hiding spots if and when we come up against a mob. Cohen nodded thoughtfully. And less likely a house is going to have a battery backup on their alarm system, he added. Lyons pointed to him, nodding in agreement. Right, last thing we need is a place to hide, only to set one of those off, he said. I know this is a suicide mission and all, but I'd like to think I'm good enough to make it past Lancaster. Wrangle walked to the window, looking out at the cloudy sky. He sighed. The thick cover blocked out what little moonlight had been scheduled that night. He glanced back over his shoulder. Don't suppose you have some night vision goggles laying around, do you? he asked. Afraid not, Jacob replied with a little wince. We do have a night vision rifle scope, though. Only one, however. Wrangle took a deep breath, approaching the table again. It'll have to do, he said, and checked his watch, noting that they had under forty-five hours. As much as I would love to wait until the sun is back up to make this run, we simply don't have the time. He shook his head and addressed his men. Everybody, gear up. We're going on a night raid. Chapter 3 The group parked a truck on the outskirts of the neighborhood, slowing down half a mile out and stopping a quarter mile from it. The headlights were off but there was just enough moonlight to show the road. A lonely stretch of highway that led into a dense collection of houses. Wrangle pulled out the night vision scope, clicking it on and peering through it towards the cluster of homes. Several figures moved between the houses, and he began to count. And once he got to a dozen without an end in sight, he lowered the scope and muttered under his breath. How we looking, Sarge? Reed asked quietly. This is going to be a bitch and a half, Wrangle quipped. Let's get ready to move. Everybody piled out of the truck, readying their gear, checking their guns but drawing quiet melee weapons for the time being. Wrangle took a deep breath and faced them. Can't see much in there, but none of it is looking good, he said firmly. 
we have to assume heavy resistance. Now, I'm not a fan of leaving men behind, but if you get separated from the group, just know you're on your own. This mission is more important than any one of us, and we can't be wasting time coming and getting you. Jacob raised a finger cutting in with, However... Wrangle cut him off with a glare, but the civilian waved his hand to try to get his chance to speak. The sergeant begrudgingly nodded, giving him the floor. However, Jacob continued, inclining his head in thanks, if you do get left behind, try and make it back to the neighborhood and watch this spot. I'll make sure someone from my group comes back out at this time. We'll flash our lights and wait an hour for you to get to us. Wrangle let out a breath. Thank you, he said, all annoyance from the interruption forgotten. Least I can do, Jacob replied. All right, fall in, Wrangle said. Reed, you're bringing up the rear. Cohen, you're on babysitting duty. Cohen winked at Jacob. You stay close, he said. I'm not going to let anything get you. The civilian nodded, and Wrangle pulled out the scope again, taking quick stock of the area before nodding and securing it heading off in the direction of the neighborhood. The group moved with haste, just off of the road as they approached the houses. They were all single-story homes for the most part, with a few trees making things even darker as the moonlight was barely visible through the clouds. Wrangle stopped the group about fifty yards from the first row of houses. He scanned a few yards, seeing movement in all of them but picked the one just to the right of the road they were on that had four zombies in the backyard. He made some hand signals to his men about what was ahead. Preston, Lyons, and Garrett readied their weapons, and Wrangle led them in. The darkness made it difficult for them to see more than ten yards in front of them. As they moved up, the shambling figures came into view, and Wrangle kept the scope pinned to his eye, using silent hand signals to point out the targets. Garrett broke from formation, rushing up and eliminating the target before it even realized they were there. Luckily for the raiding party, the darkness helped them conceal their presence from the undead, just as much as the ghouls were concealed to them. Preston and Lyons dispatched their lone targets, and Garrett took on two more. He darted ahead, catching a zombie from behind, effortlessly jamming his knife into the base of its skull, up through the brain. He held it up pushing it forward into the other one that had turned, taking notice of the thunk sound of the blade into bone. Garrett shoved the beast forward, knocking it off balance, giving him an opening to quickly finish it off while it was on the ground. With the immediate threat in the yard dealt with, Wrangle swept the area, making sure the slight bit of noise hadn't been enough to draw anything their way. Once he made sure it was clear, they continued moving up. One down. Ten more blocks to go, he muttered under his breath, and moved the group forward. They moved through a couple more backyards, stopping at the last house on the block and taking up a position behind it. The sergeant motioned for everyone to take a knee as he peeked out from behind cover. As soon as he did, his face almost mashed into the backside of a zombie standing right there. He reached up without even thinking, grabbing the creature by its blood-soaked shirt and yanking it backwards. It fell to the ground and Preston quickly lunged forward, jamming his knife into its forehead and then darting back into position efficiently. Wrangle raised the scope to his eye and went into proper survey mode, but his heart dropped. The light resistance they'd had during the first block seemed to have been an anomaly. There were easily a hundred zombies stretched out on the street and into the next stretch of yards. Wrangle motioned for them to work backwards quietly and get into the house. Garrett reached the back door first, jamming his knife into the cheap locking mechanism and snapping it. The door fell open, and he and Lyons rushed inside, clearing the house with a quick sweep. They didn't find anything, and Wrangle ushered everyone else inside. Cohen secured the door, and the sergeant got everyone set up in the living room, taking a knee away from the windows. There's a wall of those fuckers up ahead, he said, keeping voice as low as he could. And that's just what I can see from this vantage point. Do we try a different block? Reed murmured his suggestion. Wrangle shook his head. I don't think it would make much difference if we did, he admitted quietly. 
That line looks like it goes up the full length of the block to the north and south, and with nearly a mile to go, we don't have the time to do this safely, especially since we don't know what we're dealing with at the dealership. So how do we do it? Garrett asked softly. The sergeant took a deep breath. We put our heads down and run, he said, and braced for impact. Every man in the room shot him bewildered looks, and he held up his palms in surrender. No, I'm not kidding, he assured them. Hear me out. We don't have the time or the manpower to fight our way through. Jacob sputtered. Okay, but what do we do once we break through their lines? He hissed. I don't know much, but I know those things will follow us. Man makes a good point, Sarge, Cohen added dryly. Yeah, I know he does, Wrangle snapped, brow furrowed in irritation. We're going to need to do something to separate ourselves from them before we get to the dealership. Last thing we need is a two-front war. Lyons raised a hand. We use a house like it's a roach motel, he suggested. They check in, but they can never check out. All eyes turned to him with clear confusion, some blinking as they waited for some kind of explanation that never came. What in the holy hell are you talking about? Preston finally asked, rolling his hand in the air to try to get his companion to speak. Lyons sighed, rolling his eyes. Okay, bad analogy, he admitted. But let's say we get five, six blocks up. We have a few hundred of those things on our tail with no real way to lose them. Even with the darkness, they'll just keep plowing ahead until they have a reason to change course, he shrugged. So we get into a house, and we wait. Cohen threw up his hands. Wait for what? he asked. We wait for them to catch up, Lyons declared, and the silence afterwards was thick with even more confusion. Bud, I don't know what you've been smoking, but can you share with the rest of us? Reed finally asked. I'd like to be fucked up enough to think this is a good idea. Wrangle nodded, a grin emerging on his face slowly as he chewed over Lyon's suggestion. Sarge? Garrett asked, cocking a confused brow. Lyons, you're a genius, Wrangle said. The private blinked in surprise. Rare that I'm accused of that, he drawled. But I'll take it. It's brilliant, the sergeant continued. Those things will go into the house and start making a racket with their moaning and knocking stuff over. It will pull the ones coming after us in their direction and keep them occupied so we can get out the back and have time to scope out the dealership. He glanced over at the dining room table and got up, striding over. He gave the wood a good knock and then bent over to look beneath it at the thick legs. He grabbed the sides and gave it a good wiggle to test how sturdy it was, and turned around triumphantly. We're using this as a battering ram, he said, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. Should allow us to break through that first line in the street and get to the next yard. There weren't any fences on this side of the street or on the next block either. From what I could see, maybe we'll get lucky and have some on the run to break up the mob. Preston wrinkled his nose. Or maybe an HOA is finding a way to screw us from beyond the grave, he quipped. Seems par for the course with the way this mission is going. Reed muttered. Wrangle sighed, shaking his head with a growl to dismiss their banter. Garrett, you're with me on table duty, he instructed, pointing at the private, who got to his feet and rushed over. Garrett lifted one corner of the table, testing the heft, and then let out a low whistle. Hope you didn't skip leg day, Sarge, he quipped. This thing is going to be a beast to run with. Wrangle shook his head. We just have to get through the front lines, and then we can ditch it, he said firmly. Garrett nodded. Hear that? he confirmed. The sergeant turned back to the group. Okay, we're going in two columns. Stay compact and move quick, he instructed, and tossed the night vision scope to Reed, who nearly fumbled it but recovered quickly. We're plowing through them, but once that table drops, you take point, Corporal. I figure we need at least two blocks from the dealership to buy us enough time to get in without worrying about our flank. So, find us a spot and get us in there. Reed nodded and looked through the scope, fiddling with it to make sure he knew where the power button was. Questions? Wrangle asked, looking around. And when everyone shook their heads, he whirled a hand in the air. Good. Let's do this. 
He and Garrett picked up the table, moving it to the back of the house and carefully setting it outside on the back deck, without making any noise. The others lined up behind them, shoulder to shoulder so that their line didn't trail too far behind the battering ram. Reed stood second in line, scope at the ready. Wrangle nodded to Garrett, and they picked up the heavy table, resting the top legs on their shoulders for support. The sergeant raised a thumb into the air to let everyone know they were ready to go, and then turned towards the road which was about twenty yards away. Thick lines of ghouls wandered aimlessly in the dim moonlight. It was almost as if they were staying in the light where they could see the movement of their undead buddies. Whatever the reason, Wrangle hoped their ranks thinned considerably once they got past the street. Brisk pace, on my mark, the sergeant whispered, and at Garrett's nod in his periphery, took a deep breath. Now. He moved forward in unison with the private, building momentum as they got closer to the mob in the road. There were forty or so zombies directly in front of them, and easily a hundred on either side, stretching down the road. As soon as their footsteps hit pavement, the sound echoed through the air, drawing the attention of the masses that turned in their direction. A terrifying number of moans filled the air as they pushed forward. They hit the first few zombies with tremendous force, smacking them against the heavy wood of the tabletop. Some of the creatures on the outer edge flew off to the side, while some were just steamrolled. As they fell to the ground, the soldiers were careful to keep their balance, deftly stepping in the gaps between rotting arms and legs, and praying they would avoid teeth. The duo continued to push hard, carving through the mass of ghouls with relative ease. However, the noise had made them popular. The soldiers behind them dodged the fallen, while shoving the creatures that didn't get knocked down to the side, buying them precious seconds to make it across the street. When the table got a little more than halfway through the mob, they started to slow down, each zombie they hit making the momentum fade more and more. Reed and Lyon shoved hard into Wrangle and Garrett's backs, pushing to give them a bit of a boost. The added help gave the group enough force to break through to the other side of the road. As they stepped off of the pavement, however, Garrett's foot slipped on the grass and he lost his balance. As he tumbled forward, he inadvertently shoved the table, sending it flying to the side and smacking into a few ghouls on the grass. He hit the ground hard, sliding head first as if he were trying to steal a base. Lions leapt into action behind him, jumping over Garrett's fallen form as zombies converged on the downed soldier. He planted one foot on the ground before diving ahead, arms outstretched. Lion shoved his head between the two zombies in front of him, wrapping them up with his arms and shoving them to the ground. This gave Garrett enough time to scramble to his feet and shove the zombie to his left back, staggering it. He whirled and grabbed Lyons by the belt, jerking him up from the disorienting zombies grasping at him from the ground. The group quickly made it clear of the threat, running through the darkened yards as Reed stepped up to lead the way with the night vision scope. They fell into a single line, followed his lead as he darted from side to side to avoid ghouls shuffling around in the dark. As they progressed over the next few blocks, it was the same strategy, weaving in between ghouls as they raced towards the dealership. The resistance was fairly light, however. They heard the marching footsteps and moans of the ghouls they plowed through. Finally, they made it within three blocks of the dealership, and Reed spotted it through the scope surveying the business buildings and finding a whole lot of movement. He motioned to the others that they were going to the next house, which was in the middle of the block. They rushed to the back patio door, which was sliding glass. Wrangle stepped up and jammed his knife into the locking mechanism, shattering it and sliding open the door quickly. He waved the men in, Reed handing over the scope as the other four did a quick sweep of the spacious single-story home. About two and a half more blocks before you hit the businesses, Reed said as Wrangle peered out the door. Looks like it's a hell of a mess up there, too. The sergeant spotted a few creatures shambling their way, the tip of the iceberg. Can you and Garrett handle the diversion? he asked. Reed nodded sharply. Easily, he replied. Good, Wrangle said, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. 
I'm taking the rest of the men and scoping out the dealership. He leaned out the back door, using the scope to look up towards the businesses. There was a two-story house one away from the end of the block. He handed the scope over to Reed and pointed to the house. We're going to hole up there, he explained. You and Garrett handle the diversion and rendezvous with us. That should give us a vantage point to come up with a plan by the time you get there. The corporal nodded again. On it, Sarge, he said, and headed off into the house to find Garrett and fill him in on the plan. A few moments later, Lyons and Preston approached the back door as Wrangle stepped outside to stab a few shamblers in the head. The sergeant turned and walked back to them as the bodies fell. Reed said you're ready to move? Preston asked. Wrangle nodded. Yeah, we gotta figure out our next steps, he said. Let's move out. Eliminate any target we come across. We don't need them making noise while we plot. As Cohen and Jacob joined them, the sergeant led the quartet, making up his team out the back of the house, using the scope to make sure the coast was clear. They ran through yards, stabbing a few ghouls on the way towards the back door. Wrangell wasted no time jimmying open the lock, and the group piled into the house, Preston shutting and securing the door behind them. The sergeant and Cohen led a sweep of the bottom floor, checking the various rooms and finding nothing. Preston went up the stairs, expecting the worst, but breathing out a sigh of relief when he found nothing. He looked down the stairs and called out a sharp, Clear! prompting the rest of the men to come upstairs. They all headed into the master bedroom, throwing open the curtains facing the business district. The clouds had parted just enough to allow some moonlight through and it painted a terrifying and demoralizing picture. The dealership stood in front of them in all its glory. A full block of high-end off-road vehicles lined up in a row, with a giant glass building shimmering behind it like a beacon, even more expensive vehicles sitting just inside. But, of course, the moonlight bathed the troubling development of hundreds of zombies wandering through the lot. Worse, there were hundreds more on the roads and parking lots of the other businesses, with very little open space between them. Wrangle swallowed hard, letting out a deep sigh before taking a knee. All right, he said, keeping his tone as optimistic and firm as he could. Let's come up with a plan. Chapter 4 Reed and Garrett cleared the path through the house from the back door to the bedroom window at the far end of the home. They made sure that there was nothing in their way that could trip them up as they escaped. Reed came out of the bedroom as Garrett stood by the back door, the corporal sidling up next to him and peering outside. How are we looking? Reed asked quietly. Garrett shrugged. Got a few customers, but sounds like the main group is about a block away, he said. How many? Reed asked, taking a deep breath. Six, seven maybe? Garrett replied, tilting his head back and forth. It's too dark out there. Reed pulled out his knife, prompting his companion to do the same. Well, let's give our guests a proper welcome while we wait on the mob, the corporal declared. Garrett grinned and nodded, and the two soldiers stepped out onto the back patio. Reed tapped his knife on the metal rim of an outdoor table, and the clang echoed through the night air, catching the attention of the half-dozen zombies in the backyard. The duo spread apart about five yards from each other, waiting on the slow-moving prey to get within striking distance. One by one, they struck the ghouls down, simple stabs to their heads and letting the bodies fall to the grass. Within moments, the threat was eliminated and the sounds of moans coming from the mob continued to intensify. You think this decoy is going to work? Garrett asked, cocking a brow. Reed shrugged. We don't need it to last forever, he reminded the other soldier. Just long enough to hit the dealership and drive off in a hot new ride. Kind of sad it took a zombie apocalypse for us to experience that new car smell, Garrett said wistfully, shaking his head. Reed scoffed. What are you talking about? he teased. I had that with every car I ever owned. Wasn't aware corporals got that big of a pay boost, Garrett quipped. Reed winked at him. Big enough of one to spring for a bottle of new car smell spray, he joked. 
The private chuckled and shook his head. So, you riding around in a beat-up sedan, missing a hubcap and jamming out to AM radio with that new car smell? He asked. It's the little things in life, Reed replied with a grin. Well, at least I know what to get you for Christmas, Garrett said. The corporal rolled his eyes. That'll be nice, he drawled. I can sit in the driveway and breathe it in, or maybe pop it into neutral and coast down a hill. Before Garrett could respond, the moans nearby grew quite loud, prompting them to look out into the yard. A mob of rotting flesh emerged from the darkness, shambling forward and following the last meal they'd been chasing. Game time, Garrett said, and both men readied themselves before beginning to make noise. They let out whistles, clapping their hands and banging on the patio table. It didn't take much to change the course of the mob, who immediately veered towards them. Dozens were on the front line, stretching back into the darkness with God only knew how many behind. The duo waited until the creatures were nearly at the patio before they began to walk backwards towards the house. They moved deliberately, keeping a five-yard gap between them and the monsters. It didn't take long for there to be dozens of zombies in the kitchen, piling in through the door, making a racket as they knocked over tables, chairs and various things from the walls. The two soldiers continued retreating down the hallway, making sure the attention was focused on them. In the bedroom, now, Reed barked, and they turned and ran down the remainder of the hallway, leaving the door open behind them in the hopes it would let more ghouls inside. Reed reached the window, looking outside to make sure the coast was clear in their landing zone. He didn't see any movement, and waved Garrett forward. Get out there, he said. The private nodded and quickly hopped through the window, landing on his feet and drawing his knife. He looked side to side, making sure he was alone. As Reed landed, the two of them quietly moved to the back of the house, peeking out around the corner towards the mob. Much to their delight, the diversion had worked. A good ninety-five percent of the zombies clamoured to get into the house, with only a small smattering of ghouls bypassing the frenzy. The soldiers glanced at each other and gave a shrug as if to say, Close enough and moved to the front of the house to run through the yards towards the rendezvous spot. When they reached it, they circled back to the rear of the house, looking towards the one they'd come from. They could hear the moans and noise from the house, but couldn't see any significant creature movement through the darkness. Looks like it might have worked, Garrett whispered. Reed nodded. At least one thing is going right on this mission, he muttered. The duo moved inside, quietly shutting the door behind them, immediately greeted with heated bickering echoing from upstairs. Or not, Reed said with a sigh, and the duo trudged up the stairs. The master bedroom door stood open, and Jacob spotted the two soldiers first. Sergeant, he said, motioning to the door. The bickering halted, and Wrangle looked up at his men entering the room. So, what did we miss? Reed asked, cocking a brow at the sheepish faces all around. Take a look for yourself, Cohen snapped, motioning to the window. The two soldiers walked to the window, assessing the intense zombie situation around the dealership. Garrett let out a low, impressed whistle. That's, uh, um, challenge, he stammered. That explains part of the story, Reed quipped, turning back to the group. What's got everybody so heated? Lions wanting to do something stupid, Preston scoffed, throwing up his hands. The corporal cocked his head. He does that every day, he said, whirling his hand in the air to get the rest of the facts. Yeah, but this is exceptionally stupid, and I'm not allowing it to happen, Wrangle declared, his eyes cold as ice. Lyons shook his head. You don't have a choice, Sarge, he said, a note of regret in his voice. He looked forlorn, but determined. Like someone who knew he had to do something awful, but that it was important. Which, to be honest, was the whole mission, let alone this small part in it. Bullshit, Wrangle snarled, and it seemed as if they were about to start arguing again. Reed raised his hands, a palm to each of them, quieting it before it started up. What does he want to do? 
he asked firmly, like a stern parent. Commit suicide, that's what, Wrangle snapped. Going on a suicide run isn't the same as committing suicide, Lyon shot back, rolling his eyes. And besides, we don't have another way. The sergeant shook with agitation, shaking his head like he was trying to convince himself there was another way. Convince anyone there was another way. Reed furrowed his brow and turned to Lyons. So what's your plan? he asked. We need to pull those things away from the building long enough to get inside, get the keys and take off in those trucks, the private explained, motioning with his hands as he did so. The only way we can do that is if one of us gets to the other side of the dealership and starts making a racket. And I'm clearly the man for the job. He put a hand to his chest, puffing it out. What? Garrett barked a laugh. Shit, man. You're slower than any of us. Exactly, Lyons drawled, spreading his hands as if his point were obvious. Garrett blinked at him in confusion, raising his eyebrows and shaking his head, still not understanding. We all know I'm the weakest link in this group, Lyons explained, as if it were the most casual thing in the world. There's a lot I can't do, but I know I can do this. I'm the most logical choice. He raised a fist. Reed shared a glance with Wrangle, the former looking intrigued and the other looking defeated. They knew he wasn't wrong. If we don't get those trucks, we have no shot at preventing the meltdown, Lyons insisted. We have, what, forty-four hours to make it a couple hundred miles? Wrangle checked his watch. Forty-three and counting, he confirmed. Jacob, are there any other dealerships nearby? Lyons asked, turning his head. Ones that might be less crowded? The older man shook his head, regret tinging his voice. The only other dealership I know of is near downtown, he said. Downtown, Lyons said loudly flapping his hands towards the mass of flesh outside. So the only alternative is for all of us to run through the horde. Wrangle groaned, scrubbing his hands down his face. Lions, he said softly. I just... I know, the private cut in emphatically. I know you can't ask me to go on a suicide run. That's why I'm telling you I'm going to do it. How many people are going to die if we don't pull this off, Sarge? He spread his hands, but the question was rhetorical, and nobody bothered to answer. So unless you see another way to get us there on time, this is the only one. Wrangle groaned again, thinking hard, and looked out the window, staring at the ghouls in the street. They were spaced out enough that a soldier could slip through them, make it to the other side, maybe survive such a run. Jacob, he finally said, turning to their companion. I want your word that you'll come back every day for a week. He blinked at the sergeant. A week? he asked. Wrangle nodded. One week, he confirmed. Every day so that Lyons has every conceivable chance to escape and make it to safety. Will you give me your word on that? Jacob nodded firmly. Every day for a week, sergeant, he declared. Wrangle took a deep breath. Thank you, he replied. Okay, Lyons, it's your show. What do you need? The private clapped his hands together with a grin and approached the window. He took a knee and studied the mob plotting his course through the hundreds of zombies. He managed to spot a path through the bodies, but it was a tight fit. Preston, go into the other bedrooms, he instructed. See if you can find any quiet projectiles. The private in question cocked a brow. Quiet projectiles? he asked, confused. Lyons nodded. Pilot gun, slingshot, marbles, anything small that I can use with reasonable accuracy, he explained. Preston nodded and tapped Jacob on the shoulder to come with him to go look. Wrangle sidled up next to Lyons, resting a hand on his thigh. What you thinking? he asked. Lyons pointed and motioned as he talked. So the group on the first block is pretty spread out with a bit of an opening at that intersection, he explained. But the next block up looks too dense for my liking. I'm thinking if I can get halfway up the block, then toss or shoot something to the right of the next group, it should pull them away enough for me to get by. The sergeant nodded thoughtfully. And go where, though? he asked. You see that split two-story building on the left? 
Lyons asked, pointing in the distance. The back of it facing us? Wrangle nodded. Yeah, he said. The first level is low enough that I should be able to get up to it if I can find something to boost me up, Lyons explained. Dumpster, trash can, car, anything. Wrangle clenched his jaw. And what if there's nothing back there? he asked. Then it's been fun knowing you, Sarge, Lyons said with a smirk. The sergeant growled. I'm serious, he snapped. Lyons sighed. So am I, he replied. Most alleys have something in them, so it's a calculated risk. Worst case, I get surrounded and open fire, which should pull everything in a half-mile radius over to me. So, one way or another, I get the mission done. Wrangle scrubbed his hands down his face. Okay, let's think positively, he said. You get up on that first floor roof, and then what? I'll squeeze off a few shots, Lyons replied, and then thought for a moment. Hey, Garrett, can you run down to the kitchen? He asked. Find me some dish towels and anything flammable. Liquor, rubbing alcohol, anything that will get me a nice big flame. Garrett nodded. You need a lighter? He asked. Lyons pulled out his flip lighter, sparking it up before clamping it shut with a flourish. Got that covered, he said. Garrett gave him a thumbs up and took off downstairs. It's so dark out that between some noise and bright flames, it might be enough to pull a group over to me, Lyons said. Reed shook his head. Wouldn't a flashlight accomplish the same thing? he asked. Pretty sure it would, however. In an ideal world, this isn't a one-way trip for me, Lyons replied. So being able to have a torch to set those things on fire might come in handy. Reed nodded. Fair enough, he said. Preston and Jacob came back into the room carrying a leather bag and tossed it over to Lyons. Slim pickings, Preston declared, but hopefully this will work. Lyons looked inside the bag, finding heavy-duty metal miniature figures from some tabletop game. Unorthodox, he said, holding one up and turning it over in his hand. But it'll do the job. Okay, we have a plan, Wrangle said, getting to his feet. Let's get you in position. Chapter 5 Lyon stood by the back door of the house, a hunting rifle slung over his shoulder and a handgun on his hip. The bag of metallic men was tied to his belt, and a cheap grocery store canvas bag slung over his other shoulder with a few bottles of cheap vodka and every dish towel in the house. He stood there, stone-faced, the realization of what he'd volunteered for sinking in, He'd wanted to be strong for the others, because he knew he had to do this, for all the reasons outlined. He knew he could have told Wrangle he didn't want to, that his sergeant wouldn't have made him. If he had shown any sign of fear or doubt, Wrangle would have put a stop to it. But now Lyons was alone, and he was free to feel however he wanted to feel. And despite knowing this was the right move, it didn't relieve the terror that shook him to his core. Everyone else was upstairs keeping an eye on things, and he startled when the sergeant himself approached as if on cue. Lyons couldn't quite school his expression in time, and Wrangle crossed his arms, brow stern. You sure you want to go through with this? he asked. The private knew he couldn't lie. Not now. Not in the slightest, he admitted with a soft laugh. Wrangle opened his mouth, but Lyons raised a hand to stop him before he could start. Don't worry, Sarge, he said firmly, deadly serious. I got this. I'll clear them out for you, one way or another. The sergeant clenched his jaw, nodding and extending his hand. They shook, and Lyons tried to convince himself it wouldn't be for the final time. You're a good soldier, Private, Wrangle said firmly, and a better man. If things go south, I'll make sure everyone back home knows what you did. Lyons winked. With any luck, I'll be able to embellish the story myself, he joked. Wrangle chuckled, shaking his head. The private enjoyed the tiny reprieve, and they exchanged claps on the back before Lyons headed out the door, not looking back. He moved at a quiet, deliberate pace through the yards, heading towards the business portion of town. He stopped at the end of the last house, 
taking a knee in the shadows and surveying the situation. A chill ran down his spine at the sight of the enormity of the problem. He'd seen it from the window, sure, but he was safely behind the glass. But this was a different story. He could hear them, smell the putrid stench wafting from their rotten flesh. A couple hundred zombies spread across a few blocks, shuffling about, thankfully completely unaware of his presence. He studied their movement, what little there was, as they shambled about clumsily, moving only a step or two every few moments. A few would occasionally bump into each other and become agitated, thrashing about in anger at the perceived aggressor before going back to their aimless wandering. Lyons saw his path through, which was a lot tighter than it appeared from the upstairs bedroom. He drew his knife in his offhand and grabbed a handful of metal figurines with the other. Fuck it, he thought, taking a deep breath. Here goes nothing. He broke from cover, stepping towards the dimly lit road. The only advantage he had was that the moon was still concealed by a light cloud cover, making the field of vision relatively low on the street for the ghouls. As soon as his foot hit the pavement, he winced, trying his best to step lightly, but it didn't work very well. His boots made enough of an impact that the noise attracted a zombie's gaze ten yards away. It turned and ambled in his direction, seemingly too dark for it to make a positive identification that it was a potential meal and not just a noise. Lyons picked up the pace, moving at the speed of a mall walker on a mission, not wanting to draw more attention than necessary his way. When he was about twenty yards into the road, his footsteps began to really grab the attention of the surrounding ghouls. Several to his right turned in his direction, and he tossed his handful of figurines over their heads. The little metal dudes clinked on the ground behind them, drawing their attention. Unfortunately for Lyons, it also grabbed the attention of the creatures on the other side of him, where a couple dozen turned towards him. His gut sank when he realized the sound was much louder than what he'd anticipated. He saw he was in trouble as the moans grew louder, so he took off in a sprint towards the intersection, which was teeming with ghouls, but still had a small pathway for him to rush through. A zombie stepped into his path as he approached, and he lowered his shoulder, lining himself up with the creature's stomach. His pathway was quickly closing, but Lyons tried not to think about that as he powered through. The ghoul thrashed about, grabbing at the back of his shirt as the soldier lifted it off of its feet and shoved it towards the other zombies. The body was lighter than it would have been in life due to the decaying meat falling from the bone and he managed to slam it into the handful of bodies closing his way through. As they tumbled to the ground, Lyons didn't stop, leaping with everything he had over the writhing mass of bodies, barely grazing their outstretched hands as he flew and landed on the other side. The pathway to the alley was mostly clear, but just to be safe he pulled out another handful of metallic soldiers from his pouch and tossed them towards the other side of the street. His throw was on target the little men smacking into a giant plate-glass shop window, sending a high-pitched ting through the air and drawing the attention of several zombies at the back of the pack. He ducked and dodged around bodies, avoiding being grabbed by gnarled fingers. When Lyons broke through the last line of creatures between him and the alley, his heart soared with hope. But his footsteps hitting the pavement hard drew the attention of the distracted ghouls that had been heading for the shop window. As he drew closer to the alley, which was barely wide enough for a vehicle to go through, a ghoul stepped out from around the fence on the opposite side of the building. Lyons grabbed it by the shirt, stabbing quickly into its head and tossing the body to the ground at the opening of the alleyway. He hoped it would maybe trip up a few of the creatures pursuing him. Every moment counted here. He darted into the alley, quickly surveying the situation. About halfway down forty yards or so, there was a mob of zombies who hadn't noticed him yet. They were about ten yards past the end of the two-story building, where the single-story building was. Much to his dismay, the only object around was a heavy-duty plastic trash bin that was right at the break point between the single and two-story building, only ten yards away from the zombies against the fence. If he ran, they'd swallow him up before he could reach it. 
He glanced over his shoulder at the swarm of zombies still lumbering in his direction. He walked quickly, but softly, towards the trash can. He was halfway when a few zombies tripped over his corpse booby trap and smacked into the pavement, voicing their displeasure at the inconvenience. The noise resonated through the air, reaching the opposite mob. Lions watched with dread as they turned, moaning and moving towards him. He had no choice now but to break out running. He took off at a dead sprint, knowing he only had a few brief moments before he would be trapped. He glanced up at the fence to his left, seeing barbed wire spirals at the top. It was all or nothing. He reached the can with only seconds to spare before the ghouls would meet him, and quickly dragged it to the building side, relieved to feel the heft in it to weigh it down and give it stability at least. He slammed the heavy-duty plastic container against the wall and quickly scrambled up onto it, taking care to put his weight on the edges. The last thing he wanted was to fall through the center of it. Dying was bad, but spending eternity as a zombie trapped in a trash can seemed like the cruelest fate imaginable. His fingertips barely reached the top of the wall, grazing the top edge of the roof. He glanced down at the zombies just about to reach him and regretted it instantly, adrenaline pulsing through his heart. He bent his knees and leapt up as hard as he could, knowing this was his only chance to get it right. He managed to get a firm grip on the edge of the roof, and hope soared in him as he pulled himself up, groaning. Fingers scraped the bottoms of his boots, putting the fear of God into him and making him pull even harder. He finally got his whole arm over and steadied his hold before hauling the rest of his body over the top. Lions laid on his back for several moments, breathing heavily and relieved that he managed to get to this point alive. He listened to the moans below, almost like they were angry that they'd let their feast get away. Better luck next time, he huffed under his breath, and took in a few deep lungfuls of post-panicked air, before hauling himself to his feet. He inched over to the edge, peeking over at the chaos he'd so narrowly avoided. The trash can began to bang against the side of the building as the zombies converged on where he'd been, moshing against it and making noise. Even through the darkness, he could see a hundred ghouls all reaching up towards him, mouths open in wretched moans. He walked over to the two-story building connected to the roof he was on. A ladder connected them, making it easy to get to the top. He walked over to the edge and looked down at the dealership outline in the dim moonlight. There was still significant movement on the street and in between the vehicles. He made two fists and reared his head back, letting out a victory yell to celebrate the fact that he'd actually made it successfully to this position. It had been a risk, and an incredibly dicey one at that. But he'd done it. He was alive. He could complete this mission properly. He pulled out one of the dish towels and doused it in alcohol before piercing it with his knife. He snapped out his lighter and put flame to fabric, sending it up in a glorious blaze. He waved it back and forth like an air traffic controller, whooping with excitement. Come get me, you bastards! He bellowed, and waved it a few more times before whipping it down into the street. Fire illuminated the crowd as it descended, showing that they were marching towards him and exploded in a spectacular array of flaming limbs. All right, Sarge, I did my job, Lyons said as he pulled out another rag. Now go stop this thing from melting down. He lit up his second torch and continued hollering, focusing on the mission instead of what tomorrow would bring for him, stranded on a roof in a sea of the dead. Chapter 6 Sergeant Wrangle and the men looked towards the two-story building in the distance, relieved to see the makeshift torch lighting up the night. That crazy son of a bitch did it, Reed breathed, shaking his head. Jacob squinted. Is it working, though? he asked hoarsely. Wrangle pulled out the night vision scope and looked at the dealership lot. The creatures between the vehicles slowly moved towards the screaming private though they weren't moving quite as fast as he would like. 
with some of them getting hung up on cars as they attempted to pursue the noise. They're moving, he said slowly. Maybe ten minutes and we'll be good, but we're going to have to be quiet. How do you want to play it, Sarge? Reed asked. Wrangle studied the movement of the creatures, trying to plot a course to the side door of the building. He thought he had it figured out, however it worried him that he couldn't see what was lurking in the neighborhood. We need to come up the neighborhood side, he said. We can use the cars at the end of the lot as cover, and move to the side doors by the maintenance bays. Any of those doors open? Garrett asked, stepping forward. The sergeant shook his head. None of the bay doors are, he replied. But the office entrance is a glass door, so if it isn't open, at least we know we can get in. Reed sighed. And making a hell of a lot of noise in the process, he muttered. True, Wrangle agreed. But we shouldn't need much time once we're in there. You say that, but we have to find the keys to those vehicles, Cohen put in. That could take some time. Jacob shook his head. Not necessarily, he said. The soldiers all turned to him. How so? Preston asked. My brother used to work at a dealership years ago, Jacob explained, waving a hand vaguely over his shoulder. There's a lockbox in the manager's office that has all the keys. At least there was at the place he worked at. We find that box, we find the keys. With as big as that lot is, there's going to be a ton of keys, Garrett murmured, shaking his head. Cohen shrugged. You'd think they would have the keys marked with where they're parked, he suggested. With the way this trip is going, Garrett began with a sigh. Yeah, I know, Cohen cut him off, rolling his eyes and waving for his companion to stop. Regardless, Wrangle said, bringing everyone's attention back to him, that's going to be our best bet. When we get in there, I'll take care of monitoring the door. Reed, Cohen, you clear the room. Preston, Garrett, and Jacob, you're on key duty. How many vehicles we need, Sarge? Garrett asked. At least two, Wrangle replied. If we can find the keys for three, let's take them. We can always siphon the gas and take it with us. He looked back through the scope, seeing the zombies continuing to move away from the lot. He pocketed the gadget before standing up. Okay, let's do this, he said firmly. The soldiers and Jacob nodded walking downstairs and staging by the back door. Wrangle took point, looking out back, relieved to see that the backyard was clear of zombies. He turned to the team. We move quick, we move silent, he said softly but firmly. At least until we get to the door. If I have to make noise getting it open, then we're going to be on a short clock. So move like you have a purpose. Questions? Everyone shook their heads, so he raised a hand. Here we go, he said, and led them out of the house, moving silently over to the side of it. The main road between the neighborhood and the business district was only fifteen yards away. Most of the zombies moved towards Lyons, who was still lighting fires and screaming at the top of his lungs, his voice echoing through the dim night, almost a comfort to the sergeant who'd been terrified he wouldn't survive. It was a block up for the group to get to the dealership, which was just across the street. Wrangle led the group to the front of the house, taking a knee when they got to the edge, taking out the scope and peering through. There was a small pack of ghouls at the back of the next house, which was directly across the lot. There weren't many, no more than six, shambling slowly towards the source of the noise. We have to take that pack out, Wrangle whispered. Get ready. Reed and Garrett were directly behind him, both of whom pulled out knives. Wrangle drew his as well and led them into battle. The trio rushed across the yard, walking quietly on the pavement before resuming their quick pace on the grass. Wrangle picked up a head of steam as he approached the small mob, slamming into them from the side, knocking four of the six to the ground. Garrett and Reed quickly came up to the two still standing, delivering strikes to the side of the head and dropping them. Wrangle, meanwhile, scampered to his feet and delivered kill strikes to the fallen creatures. Garrett stepped in and killed the last one, and Wrangle finished off the three others. Before they could move, significant moaning echoed from the yard. It was too dark to see, but the sergeant quickly drew his scope and looked, finding a few dozen creatures within twenty yards of them.
headed their way. Move, he hissed urgently, leading them out of the yard and across the dealership lot. As they moved towards the cars, the clouds broke a bit, and some moonlight hit the lot. There were still significant numbers of zombies who hadn't been able to navigate the rows of cars to pursue lions, maybe thirty in total, all within fifty yards of the target door. Wrangle moved the group up to the first row of cars, with a couple of zombies standing between them and the door. He pointed them out, getting Reed and Garrett to step up and dispatch them without breaking stride. They reached the door, the group looking behind them as the sergeant focused on the handle. The mob from the neighborhood had started to move in between the vehicles, trying to track down the group. Their moans and smacking against the cars drew the attention of other zombies in the area, agitating everyone. Sarge, they're on to us, Reed warned, voice on edge. Wrangle attempted to use his knife to wedge open the door, but it was no use. It was locked up tight. He let out a sigh before readying the butt of his rifle. Breaching, he said and then smacked his rifle against the bottom part of the door, smashing the shatterproof glass, but not breaking it out. The sound was quite loud, and its echo was quickly met with a significant amount of moans from the pursuing group. Wrangle reacted quickly, smashing it several more times rapidly, before eventually knocking it completely out. We're in, he barked, and ducked in first, taking up guard position just in case they weren't alone in the building. The rest of the team scrambled inside quickly. You know your missions. Move, the sergeant barked, and the soldiers tore into the showroom. Wrangle looked around the immediate area for something to block the door with, spotting a black leather couch in the waiting area of the maintenance portion of the building. He rushed over, tossing his rifle onto it before beginning to push it towards the door. The squeal against the floor made him wince, but he moved it as quickly as he could by himself to block the door. When he got there, he tossed his rifle to the ground, spun the couch around so that the back was facing against the door, and flipped it over. It fit pretty well, covering the bottom portion that had been broken out. He knew it wouldn't hold long, especially as the ghouls were almost to the door, walking alongside the glass wall towards the opening. Wrangle put himself parallel with the opening in the door, wedging his knee into the crevice of the couch and using his other leg to push, keeping pressure on it right at the point of entry. It didn't take long for the creatures to press against it. However, most of them were standing tall, making eye contact with him through the top portion of the door, giving him hope that he'd be able to hold them at bay while the others worked. Yeah, that's right. All eyes on me, he said with a sneer. Preston led Garrett and Jacob through the back of the showroom where the offices were. He had a flashlight out, shining quickly into every room as they went to make sure they were empty. The first few offices were tiny, which were clearly not the manager's office, so he ignored them. They moved down the line until they got to the corner office. He shone the light through the window on the door, seeing a nice leather chair behind a big desk, with awards on the shelves. He also spotted movement inside from a large imposing figure in a tattered and bloody suit. One hostile, and he's a big boy, Preston reported. Garrett straightened his shoulders. So am I, he declared. Preston nodded and got into position so Garrett could take care of the threat. The private opened the door and Garrett rushed in, knife at the ready. The creature barely had time to turn towards the footsteps before Garrett was on it. The blade sank into the base of the ghoul's skull, and it slammed hard into the ground. We're clear, he said, doing a quick sweep of the room. The other two came inside, looking for the key box. Jacob finally spotted it on the far wall and rushed over, but couldn't get it open. Locked, he called. Preston smiled as he walked over, waving his knife around. It's all good, I have the key, he said, and jammed the tip right into the keyhole giving it a good smack on the hilt and jamming it right through the flimsy mechanism. The box rattled as it opened, filled with shiny silver keys. I need light, Jacob said, holding up a hand. Preston shone his flashlight on the keys as Jacob thumbed through them, checking all the tags. I need to know the color of the showroom vehicles, he said. 
Preston motioned for Garrett to check it out, and the private nodded, ducking over to the door to look. The three biggest ones are black, red, and silver, he called back. I got more if you can't find those. Jacob looked through the labels on the keys, finding the words showroom and black, red, and silver on successive keys. He pulled them out. We're in business, he said. The three of them came outside the office, with Jacob handing off keys to the other two. They checked the vehicles, putting the keys in and starting them up. All three sprung to life, sputtering momentarily after sitting idle for so long, before going into a constant purr as the engine settled in. How much gas you got? Garrett called. I have a quarter tank. One third, Jacob replied. Just north of fumes, Preston barked. Reed and Cohen approached after clearing the room. You gotta get the Sarge, Preston instructed. We can't sit here very long. I'll get him. You figure out who's leading the caravan, Reed instructed, and jogged back to the door, where Wrangle stood straining against the couch to hold it in place. The mob outside had grown to easily sixty or seventy creatures, all trying to get inside. We're good to go, Sarge, Reed said. All right. As soon as I move, though, those things are coming in, Wrangle warned. Reed came over and put his foot against the base of the couch to hold it in place long enough for the sergeant to get to his feet. He nodded that he was ready, and then Wrangle leapt up. The two men took off running as the mob pushed the couch out of the way quickly. They were slow to wriggle their way inside, however, and even slower to get to their feet, which gave the duo some precious extra time to get to the vehicles. Wrangle leapt into the silver behemoth with Garrett behind the wheel. Let's roll, he said and the private honked the horn to let the others know it was time to go. He floored it, slamming through the plate glass window, sending a terrific noise and shards of safety glass everywhere. The other two vehicles quickly fell in line as he led them out of the lot and onto the road. Head back out through the neighborhood, Wrangle instructed. Garrett nodded as he drove up a couple of blocks before cutting it over to the residential area. The three vehicles raced down the street as fast as they could hoping the noise wasn't there long enough for zombies to catch on to them. They passed a few stragglers, but nothing too significant. Finally, after several moments, they were out of the town and into wide-open desert. As soon as they made it, the red vehicle behind them flashed their lights. Slow down. Let's see what they want, Wrangle said. They pulled over, and the other vehicle pulled up beside them. Jacob rolled down the passenger window. Okay, you need to follow me he instructed. I don't think anything followed us, but I want to be sure. Short detour, then we're home. Lead the way, Wrangle said, waving him forward. Jacob's vehicle took point as they drove off through the desert. As they took the detour, Wrangle sat back in his seat, his mind solely on lions, and the predicament they had been forced to leave him in. Be safe, lions. Chapter 7 43 Hours Remain The group came into Actis from the west, driving through the middle of the desert, with nothing remotely close to them. They hopped on the road just to the north of town and came in as they moved the makeshift barricades. The three large four-wheel drive SUVs parked in town and immediately shut off. Wrangle jumped down quickly and motioned to every soldier who emerged. Garrett, find a tube and siphon me a gallon from this vehicle, he instructed. Put it in the one running on fumes. Yes, sir, Garrett replied, and headed off at a jog. Reed, drive Jacob back to his vehicle to retrieve it, and make sure nothing is headed this way. The sergeant continued, motioning to the two men. The corporal nodded. Come on, Jacob, let's go, he said. Wait a second, the older man replied, raising his hands. I can send one of my boys to do that later. You don't have to waste the fuel. Wrangle's brow furrowed. Are you sure? He asked. Of course, Jacob replied with a nod. They have a dirt bike they've been begging to ride, so this will be a good opportunity. Wrangle nodded in thanks. Okay, he replied. When are we headed out for fuel? Cohen asked. I'm headed out right now, Wrangle declared. The rest of you are staying put. There was a thick silence. 
With all due respect, Sarge, Reed began slowly. With all due respect, nothing, Wrangle cut in firmly. I needed all hands on deck to retrieve these things. I don't need that to go get the fuel. Jacob shook his head vehemently. You're going to take on a gang all by yourself? he gasped. Nope, the sergeant quipped, crossing his arms. Going to talk some sense into them and get what we need. Reed jutted out his chin. And if that doesn't work, he challenged. They'll probably gun me down, Wrangle replied. In which case, it's on you to finish the mission. Sarge, Cohen cut in, holding up a hand. We can take out some lowly gang members. Wrangle cocked a brow. You sure about that? He shot back. We don't know how many there are, and they're in a fortified position. Plus, I'm fairly confident there are women and children in their camp, Jacob added. It's not worth the risk, Wrangle agreed with a sharp nod. Even if we do outgun them, there's a chance they'll blow the place before we can secure it, and an even greater chance that we kill innocent civilians in the process. He smirked and gave a half shrug. Besides, I have a way with words. Reed squared his shoulders. But Sarge, I think— He began. Wrangle cut him off by stepping forward and putting his hand on the corporal's shoulder. Corporal, he said, staring into his friend's eyes. I need you to trust me. Reed swallowed hard, but then nodded, lowering his gaze in submission. Now set a timer for two hours, Wrangle instructed. If I'm not back by then, you take off. Get a full tank of gas and cover as much ground as you can. You have less than two days to get to that power plant. Reed nodded jerkily and patted his sergeant on the shoulder before stepping back. Jacob, I need you to show me where this place is, Wrangle instructed, and then held up a hand at the concerned look on the older man's face. Don't worry, you won't come within a mile of the place. I just need to know where it is. Jacob nodded and followed the sergeant over to the SUV where Garrett was approaching with a siphon. Got a hose, just need a minute and I'll have you gassed up, the private reported. Thank you, Private, Wrangle replied with a firm nod. He motioned for Jacob to get in the passenger's seat and took the driver's side himself. When they were settled, he turned to the older man. Tell me everything you know about this gang. Jacob let out a deep sigh. Ah, honestly, I don't know much, he admitted. They shoot at us on sight and they have some serious firepower. What kind of firepower? Wrangle asked, brow furrowing. Full automatic machine guns for starters, Jacob replied, and the sergeant was starting to see why the man was so afraid to venture out that way. Enough ammo for them to feel comfortable emptying an entire magazine at us just for driving through their territory. Wrangle nodded thoughtfully. Numbers? he asked. I have no idea, Jacob admitted, shaking his head. After our run-in with them, we did a little recon. Their territory stretches over several blocks, with heavy-duty fencing surrounding everything. My guess is they wouldn't do that if their numbers were small. The sergeant pursed his lips for a moment. Safe assumption, he agreed. Kind of a moot point, given it's going to be just me walking up to them. How do you plan on pulling it off? The older man asked, cocking his head. Wrangle took a deep breath. Hoping that you're correct, and that they have women and children they're looking after, he said. Jacob took a deep breath. And if they don't? he asked. Then I have to hope they believe me when I say they are going to have a bad day if they don't listen to me, he said with an air of finality. And Jacob didn't respond. There was no need to really hash out what would happen if they didn't. They both knew it. Garrett smacked the back of the vehicle, letting them know they were gassed up and ready to go. Wrangle started the engine and put it into drive. He glanced down at the gas gauge, seeing it was at an eighth of a tank, which was enough to get him there and back. He honked the horn once to let the gate men know to open up for him. He peeled out, driving at a fast pace, and a tense silence settled over the car. Both men were thinking the same thing, even though neither of them voiced it. Marching in front of a firing squad, hat in hand, Wrangle thought to himself, to beg for some gas to continue on a suicide mission. He couldn't help but laugh, a little dark humor chuckle under his breath. Jacob's brow furrowed deeply. I think it's safe to assume our senses of humor are very, very different, Sarge, he said dryly. 
More of a reflex than humor, Wrangel replied with a sigh. Just laughing at the absurdity of the situation. We were going to fly within a mile of the target and have a couple of days to figure out how to get in. Now I'm driving a freshly stolen SUV to go have a chat with a violent gang for gas so we can drive the final two hundred miles. He shook his head and laughed again. Multiple deployments, more missions and patrols than I can count. And the most important task that has ever been assigned to me is going sideways ten times over. Jacob straightened. I have faith in you, Sergeant, he said firmly. If anybody can get this job done, it's you. Wrangle snorted and shook his head. You've known me for about five hours, he drawled. What are you basing that faith on exactly? Because you're the only one I can place that faith in, Jacob replied easily. There's nobody else coming to help. The reality of that statement hit Wrangle square in the gut and hard. The older man was 100% right. If his team failed, there was nobody else. There wasn't much life left out here, but what was left would be done for. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure your faith isn't misplaced, Wrangle promised, tightening his fingers on the steering wheel. I appreciate that, Sergeant, Jacob said. The two sat in silence for several more miles before he spoke up, pointing. Okay, go ahead and pull off by that store. Wrangle spotted a long-abandoned convenience store on the side of the road missing the pumps with the glass broken out, spray paint on the side of the building. Wrangle complied, parking the vehicle at the side of the building. It's about three quarters of a mile straight up the road. You can't miss it, Jacob said. The sergeant cocked his head. You have a watch? he asked. I do, Jacob replied with a nod, pushing up his shirt sleeve. If I'm not back in ninety minutes, I want you to drive back to your community and tell the others to get moving, Wrangle said firmly. He opened the door but paused, not getting out, contemplating for a beat before adding, And if you never see me again, I want you to honor your promise to Lyons. I told you that you have my word on that, Jacob snapped. Wrangle held up his hand, pointer finger straight up. I want you to honor your promise to Lyons, he said. Then after that week, I want you to pack up and move as far east as you possibly can. Jacob blinked at him in surprise. What? he stammered. What about your men? They're good men, the sergeant said with a sigh. Extremely capable, and I trust them with my life. But the reality is that without this fuel, they're not making it to the power plant in the next forty-three hours. The older man clenched his jaw. They could get lucky and find it on the way, he insisted. But his voice sounded too hopeful and on edge. Do you really believe that? Wrangle pressed. On half a tank of fuel that they're going to find a gas station that isn't completely surrounded by those things, or has already been cleaned out by other survivors, and that has power or a manual pump to extract that fuel? Jacob took in a deep, long breath, and then shook his head. Wrangle got out of the SUV and tossed the keys to the older man. Ninety minutes, he reminded him. Start timing now. Good luck, Sergeant, Jacob said. And you better come back. I can handle the apocalypse, but I'll be damned if I have to move again. Wrangle let out a chuckle before starting his hike. He slung the rifle over his shoulder, securing it before beginning to jog at a faster than normal pace. He was so far out in the desert that he didn't care if he made noise, because there was no movement anywhere. The clouds had cleared a bit, allowing for the dim moonlight to shine on the empty landscape. The sergeant's muscles started to ache a bit, having already had a long day after a long plane ride. He couldn't pause, however, because there just wasn't time. He powered through, focusing on the mission. On everything they still had to do, everything that was at stake. Running through scenarios kept his mind focused and kept him moving. Several minutes later, Wrangle spotted the outskirts of a community. The gas station sat at the forefront. Makeshift walls made out of metal siding on either side. Wooden scaffolding put several armed men above the wall, giving them a bird's-eye view of the road. Wrangle took a knee at the side of the road and pulled out his night-vision scope to get a better look. Several dead bodies lay on the ground surrounding the wall, presumably zombies that had wandered too close. 
He hoped it was zombies at least, or else his run had been for nothing. He couldn't see inside the camp as the walls were solid, but given that they ran the entire length of the block, it was a safe bet that there were plenty of people behind them. He focused in on the closest guard tower, seeing three people sitting around a small fire pit keeping warm. That's the target, Wrangle murmured to himself. Hopefully one of those guys has enough sense not to shoot me. He secured his rifle to his back, making sure it wasn't moving. He stood up and started walking the final couple hundred yards to the camp, hands in the air, showing he was not a threat. He also added in the occasional hop and skip to show he wasn't a zombie. As he approached, the guards moved, raising weapons and aiming towards him. Don't take another step, motherfucker, unless you want your brain splattered on the highway, one of them yelled. Wrangle shook his head. Easy now, cowboy, he called back. Just looking to have a word with whoever is in charge. Oh, is that a fact? The guard barked. Well, hell, man, why didn't you say so? You want to come in for some tea and crumpets while we wait? The group cracked up at the sarcastic remark, but the sergeant stood firm, staring the young men down. Man, just smoke this asshole, one of the other guys said. Nah, not yet, the sarcastic guard drawled. I'm not done having my fun. Well, while you're having your fun, Wrangle said loudly, why don't you send one of your lackeys to go get the boss? The other two men turned from jovial to angry in a millisecond, raising their weapons, but the first guy held up a hand to keep them at bay. You got a set of balls on you, I'll give you that, he admitted. Now what makes you think Marcus wants to hear a single word that comes out of your mouth? Because if he listens to me, everybody inside those walls gets to keep living. Wrangle declared. They burst out laughing again, all three of them exaggerating, bending over and holding their guts. Oh, is that a fact now? The first guard gasped, wiping pretend tears from his eyes. So, you saying if we don't let you talk to Marcus, you're gonna come in here and kill everybody? Wrangle shook his head vehemently. Me? No, he said firmly. I'm pretty sure you'll gun me down before I take more than three steps but I do promise you everybody will die, and I'm willing to bet your two buddies there will make sure everybody knows it's your fault. And trust me, there will be plenty of time for you to dwell on your mistake, but it will be far too late to do anything about it. The guard's brow furrowed, all trace of mirth gone, and he lowered his weapon. Go get Marcus, he said over his shoulder. You serious, man? The second guard whined. Do you have any idea of what time it is? Hell, if you don't want to shoot this fool, then I will. He started to raise his weapon, but the first guard put his hand on his sidearm menacingly. Just go get him, he snarled. Now. His lackey rolled his eyes and shook his head, muttering as he walked away. Yeah, man, gonna be a few minutes, the lead guard said, turning back to Wrangle. The sergeant shrugged, hands still in the air. I'm not in a terrible rush, he drawled. At least not yet. It was a lie, of course. Every second counted, but he wasn't about to be impatient now. He had to play this just right. Yeah, all right, the guard replied, still ready with his weapon. You just make sure to keep those hands up. Don't mistake me being smart enough to realize this chat is way above my pay grade with believing the words coming out of your mouth and trusting you. Wrangle nodded. Fair enough, he replied. The two stood in an awkward silence for a few moments before the guard grunted impatiently. So what you doing out here in the middle of the night anyway? He demanded. This shit's so time sensitive it can't wait until the sun is up? Wrangle nodded. Afraid so, he said with a sigh. Trust me, I wouldn't be out here at this time of night if the situation didn't require it. I mean, look at me. If anybody needs beauty rest, it's me. The guard cracked a wry smile. Yeah. That's an understatement, he quipped. I can see it from here, and it's this dark. Maybe you're doing me a favor coming out here in the night like this. Just doing my part, man, Wrangle replied with a good-natured grin. Just doing my part. So, you a local? the guard asked, tone as conversational as if they were waiting in line for coffee on a normal day. Wrangle shook his head. Lived all over, but most recently a resident of Seattle. He replied, Seattle? 
the guard asked, cocking a brow. You're a long way from home. How is it up there? Tough, but getting better, the sergeant replied. Military came in and cleared it out. No shit, the guard gasped, eyes wide. Wrangle nodded. No shit, he confirmed. A couple hundred thousand people packed in there. Might actually make it civilization again. The guard shook his head in wonder. Never thought I'd miss having some civilization, he admitted. Kind of amazing how a shitty situation can get even worse. You had it rough out here? Wrangle asked. Man, you don't know the half of it, the guard said wistfully, shaking his head. Lost so many family and friends. I don't even know where to start. The sergeant nodded. I'm with you, man, he agreed. This shit storm has been hard on everybody. Some more than others, the guard replied. After a beat, he added, You keep that in mind when you're talking to Marcus. Wrangle grinned. Appreciate the heads up, he said. Well, your dumbass is out here in the middle of the night knocking on our door, the guard drawled. So figured somebody needed to give you some good advice. The sergeant couldn't help but chuckle, and nodded in agreement, and thanks. As if on cue a man appeared on the wall, easily double-wide to the guard, like a linebacker tank. You mean you pulled my happy ass out of bed for this, motherfucker? He snapped, dark skin glittering in the firelight. You understand what the words shoot on sight mean, don't you? The guard winced. I think you... He began, voice small. You think? Marcus bellowed. You think? Motherfucker, if you could think, you wouldn't be up here watching the wall on night shift, would you? The guard looked a little sheepish, backing down and turning his head away. Wrangle raised his voice. I just need... I don't give a good goddamn what you need, Marcus bellowed, pointing a thick finger down at the intruder. The only reason I haven't shot you down yet is because I want to see if you can give me a reason not to feed this moron to the next batch of zombies that wander through here for waking me up at this hour. He turned back to the guard, voice deadly serious. You'd better hope and pray he gives me a reason. The guard swallowed hard, eyes wide, looking desperately at Wrangle as if praying to him to make the meeting worthwhile. Okay, now you can speak, Marcus said, turning and leaning on the wall. Who are you, and what in the hell do you want? I'm Sergeant Wrangle, U.S. military and I need to get some gas from you, Wrangle said loudly. Marcus blinked once before breaking down into hysterical laughter. Did? He gasped, dissolving into laughter again before finally wiping tears of mirth from his eyes and catching his breath. Did you just say you're in the military and you want some gas? He shook his head, letting out a few. Wow, you are bald. I'll give you that. But damn, man, you're lucky I don't kneecap your punk ass and let you bleed out on the street or get eaten. You cowards cut and run, leaving us to fend for ourselves. Wrangle nodded in sympathy. All I can say is that it wasn't my decision, and it was for the greater good, he replied. But as soon as the words left his mouth, he knew it was a stupid thing to say. Damn it, and I'd said I was good with words, he thought. The greater good, Marcus roared, all traces of laughter and amusement gone. The greater good? He pointed down at the sergeant again. Tell that to my mom who didn't make it. My neighbors. Hell, man, half my damn neighborhood didn't live past the first day. We could have, if your kind helped. But as usual, nobody in the government gives a damn about us. He spread his arms, looking back and forth as if to assess his kingdom. But look at us. We're doing all right now. I'm glad to hear it, Wrangle replied politely with a bow of his head. And for what it's worth, you have my apologies. Shove your apologies, Marcus snapped, drawing a massive silver handgun, the plating shimmering in the firelight next to him. They don't bring my people back. He glared menacingly down the barrel. Now, before I put you down like a dog... I would love to know why you thought I was going to give you some of my gas. Figure if I'm going to be forced to be up at this hour, 
I might as well get some more laughs. Wrangle took a beat to compose himself and then raised his chin. Because if you don't, then you and everybody you're protecting in there will be dead, he replied firmly. So, if I don't give you what you want, then you're gonna come in here and kill me? Marcus snarled. Or your people are, since you're gonna be a puddle on the pavement. Wrangle shook his head. You familiar with the San Onofre nuclear power plant south of Los Angeles? He asked, keeping his voice as level as he could. That the plant down by the coast? Marcus asked, and the note of curiosity in his voice gave the sergeant a sliver of hope. The very same, Wrangle replied. Okay, yeah, what about it? Marcus demanded. Wrangle took a deep breath. About fifteen hours ago, our people lost the ability to control it. So as we speak, it's becoming unstable and will melt down, he said. Marcus wrinkled his nose. Oh yeah? When? he asked. Wrangle tilted his hand just enough so he could see his watch and not be making any sudden movements with his arms. A little less than forty-three hours, he said. I need the gas so my men and I can get down there to stop it from doing that. Marcus rolled his eyes. Man, Los Angeles is a couple hundred miles from here, he drawled. Why do I care if some power plant goes down? Because that radiation isn't just going to stay at the plant, Wrangle replied, keeping his voice level. He didn't want this man to feel like he was being condescended to. If you know a hurricane was about to hit Los Angeles, would you prepare for bad weather? Or just think that it's a couple hundred miles away and not your problem? Marcus pursed his lips for a moment, and then finally shook his head, tightening his grip on the gun. Look, Marcus, you need to weigh it, Wrangle gushed, voice rising with urgency. If I'm lying, then you get to spend the rest of your days telling the story of how you met the man with the biggest set of balls on the motherfucking planet, who came to your doorstep and grifted you out of forty gallons of gas with a wild story of a nuclear power plant melting down. His eyes widened begging with sincerity. However, if I'm telling the truth, then a few months from now, you and your people don't start dying from severe radiation poisoning. And let me tell you, Marcus, that shit goes slow, painful and slow, so you'll have weeks to sit and reflect on the mistake you made in this moment. You'll look over at that forty gallons of gas, wondering if drinking it will put an end to the nightmare you're going through. Marcus stood there, glaring down at him for several moments, and then glanced around at his guards, who all wore the same terrified faces. Think about your girl, man, the first guard rasped. If he's telling the truth... Marcus held up a hand to stop him from talking, and then gritted his teeth for a while, regarding the sergeant. Forty gallons? he finally asked. Forty gallons, Wrangle confirmed, hope swelling in his chest. You give me that, and you'll never see me again. Marcus cocked a brow. You just gonna carry it out of here? he asked. Wrangle shook his head. Got a vehicle just down the road, he explained. I can have it here in ten minutes. Marcus nodded slowly. Okay, I'm gonna give you what you're asking for, he said reluctantly. I'll have my men put it in the street there for you to pick up in twenty minutes. If you come sooner, or anybody but you gets out of that car, it's the last thing any of you ever do. Are we clear on that? Wrangle nodded firmly. Crystal, he replied. Good, Marcus said with a note of finality in his tone. Because I may believe your little story there, but that don't mean I trust you. Survival mindset. I totally get it. Wrangle replied with a sympathetic nod. And one more thing, Marcus snapped, raising a hand. If I give you this, and my hair starts falling out in a few months, you better hope I don't run into your ass again. The sergeant straightened his shoulders. Marcus, if your hair starts falling out a few months from now, you'll have to come find me in the afterlife, because that's the only reason I won't complete this mission, he declared. All right, the man on the wall replied, waving him off. Twenty minutes, and just you get out of the car. Thank you, Wrangle said, beginning to walk backwards away from the wall. 
You can thank me by getting your ass on the road, Marcus shot back. Forty-two hours goes by quick. Wrangle nodded one final time before turning and jogging off into the night. He glanced back over his shoulder one last time to give the guard a look of thanks for going out on a limb for him. Okay, he thought, hope rising in his chest like wildfire. We're in business. Chapter 8 41.5 hours remain. The two vehicles were gassed up, with an extra five gallons in a can in the back of each. The soldiers loaded up gear as Wrangle, Reed, Jacob, and Charlie looked over a map. Okay, so you go three miles to the east, then cut north until you hit Highway 58, Jacob explained, drawing on the map as he spoke. It's a little out of the way, but it'll keep you out of Marcus's territory. Yeah, we've bothered him enough for one day, Wrangle agreed. Jacob nodded. Once you hit the highway, keep driving east until you hit 395 south, he continued. You'll eventually hit this town called Adelanto. Well, I say town like I call this place town. But once you hit it, you need to take the first road west you can. Reed cocked a brow. Why is that? he asked. Because if you keep going south, you'll hit Hesperia which is about the size of Lancaster, Jacob explained. The corporal shuddered. Yeah, I had my fill of that place. And any other place that size, he muttered. Then what? Wrangle urged. Go a few miles, then cut south until you hit the 138, Jacob said. Follow that until you hit Cajun Junction. The trails to the east should be... He paused, studying the map for a beat before making an X. Right about there. Some trails, some small roads, should take you up near Big Bear Lake. Wrangle crossed his arms. Do we need to be worried about civilization? He asked. Jacob shook his head. Resort town, he replied. This time of year, well, the time of year all this started. It would have been pretty deserted. Which means it's going to be packed like a Sunday afternoon pro football game, Reed quipped. Well, assuming it's not, Jacob continued. Start heading south from there towards Rattlesnake Creek. Follow it to the south until you hit some roads that will take you out of the mountain region. With any luck, it'll lead you to Banning, which is a smallish town. But it's a lot better than San Bernardino. You'll have a lot of options to pick from there, none of them particularly good, but at least it'll get you that far. Wrangle took a deep breath. Better than we were, he said, and extended his hand to shake. Thank you so much. For all your help, he said sincerely. It was the least I could do after we messed up your plane, Jacob replied, lowering his gaze. The group walked outside to the vehicles, where everybody was just getting in. Wrangle reached the driver's side door, handing the map to Charlie, who rode shotgun. Before they got in, a few people emerged from the house, carrying brown paper bags and some bottles of water. Oh, thank you, Jacob greeted them. What's all this? Wrangle asked, brow furrowing. Can't go on a road trip without snacks, Jacob replied with a smile. Sorry it's not more. The sergeant shook his head as the men accepted the gifts. You're a good man, Jacob, he said. You as well, sergeant, the old man replied. Travel safe, and good luck on your mission. We'll get it done for you, Wrangle replied firmly, and then got into the vehicle, firing it up. You ready to hit the road? Charlie held up his map with a smile. And ready to navigate, he declared. Wrangle nodded, popping the SUV into gear, honking the horn a few times and waving to the locals as the gate opened up. They drove out into the desert, the bumpy ride jostling them around inside the cab. Wrangle glanced down at his watch, taking a deep breath at the fact that they had just over forty-one hours to make it a couple hundred miles. He raised his chin and focused, trying to eliminate his doubt. They'd come this far. They were going to do this. They had to. The End